Good day, everyone. Welcome to Ready, Set, Go, a webinar series sponsored by HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs, known as SNAPS. My name is Jay Lee, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. On behalf of SNAPS, I'd like to thank, thank all of you for joining us. Today's webinar is Building the Bridge, HPRP to ESG, and we'll be featuring the following presenters. Susan Ziff has been HUD's HPRP team lead and is now transitioning to take on the ESG team lead role as well. Tamora Upchurch is HUD's HPRP desk officer for Regions 5 and 6, and Caroline Fernandez, who is HUD's HPRP desk officer for Regions 4 and 7. Both Tamora and Caroline work closely with HUD field offices to monitor grantee programs. Additionally, we have two virtual help desk representatives on the line with us to answer your content question. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few logistical announcements. Today's webinar will last approximately 90 minutes. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation will be posted next week on the Homelessness Resource Exchange at www.hre.info. All attendee microphones are automatically muted for the webinar presentation. Due to the large number of attendees, there may be a slight delay in the advancement of the slides. You'll hear the presenter say, next slide, throughout the presentation to help you follow along. Next slide, please. We recommend using your phone rather than your computer speakers to listen to today's presentation. If you experience any technical difficulties, you may request assistance by using the questions box in the toolbar on your screen. Next slide, please. The questions box is also the place where you can submit your content questions during the presentation. While all of your questions are important to us, we may not be able to address all of them during the webinar. If we don't get to your question, please submit them to the virtual help desk. Please reference this presentation, Building the Bridge HPRP to ESG, if you do submit questions to the help desk. Immediately following the webinar, you'll receive a brief webinar evaluation by email. Please respond to this evaluation so we can continue to improve the delivery of future presentations. Now, I'm happy to introduce Caroline, who will begin today's presentation. Thank you, Jay. I wanted to start to go over the objectives of the webinar and to make sure that you all understand that this is designed to be a more advanced webinar than we typically present. Instead of giving you facts, we'd like you to apply the lessons learned as you begin to move strategically from HPRP into your ESG implementation. We're assuming that you already have a basic understanding of both HPRP and ESG, so we won't be getting into a lot of detail on the program requirements during this webinar. If you want to learn more about the new requirements for ESG, we have a whole series of webinars about eligible activities and new requirements posted on the HRE, and more guidance materials are coming. We're also working on a document that will walk grantees through the differences between the programs, so we didn't want to use our precious webinar time to do that here. Instead, our focus today will be on using what you've put into practice with HPRP to make the transition to ESG to address similar community needs with more limited funds and to move forward with new priorities for the ESG program. Also, we know that you've already done your substantial amendment, so we're going to be talking about how to proceed from this point forward. Many of you have already designed your fiscal year 12 programs as well as submitted those action plans to HUD, and some of you might not have yet. In either case, you can still spend some time now to design a program to reflect your written standards or improve on the written standards you have already established. Next slide, please. In this presentation, we will briefly review some major similarities and differences between the programs and keep the analysis pretty high level. We'll be talking to you about ways to make the most of ESG, keeping in mind that the grant amount is much smaller than an HPRP. We'll talk about strategic planning, implementing rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention under ESG, and we'll talk about some key aspects of ESG that you'll need to make sure you understand. Now that your substantial amendment is in, what can you be doing while you wait for approval? We know that our audience today includes HPRP grantees who will be getting emergency solutions grant funds, as well as those who will not. And we know that many of our audience members are subrecipients or subgrantees um, for HPRP or prospectively for ESG. We also want to note that since HPRP did not fund emergency shelters or street outreach services funded under the original ESG program, when we focus on the similarities and key differences throughout the presentation, 
we will not highlight any provisions applying specifically to emergency shelter or street outreach. We'll just be talking about the rapid rehousing and prevention components when we're comparing the two programs. We are preparing other documents to help recipients understand the differences and similarities between the Shelter Grants Program and the Solutions Grant Program. And now I'll turn the next part of the presentation over to our team lead, Susan Ziff. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start today by taking you through a quick history to review where we've come from and where we're headed with the new uh, Emergency Solutions Grant Program. The Emergency Shelter Grants Program was originally designed to provide short-term assistance to people who were literally homeless. Prevention services under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program were pretty limited. In contrast, HPRP, which of course was a Recovery Act program, was short-term by design as it was created as a response to the economic crisis. And of course, again, it was focused on people who would become homeless if they did not receive HPRP assistance. The Emergency Solutions Grants Program is, in some ways, a combination of both of those programs. It has expanded activities, which focus on helping people regain stability in permanent housing, but it also still maintains emergency shelter as an allowable activity and an important component. Next slide, please. Targeting under these programs is slightly different. <clears throat> under the Emergency Shelter Grants Program, targeting for prevention was limited to those four criteria that were required by the statute. And of course, there was such a small percentage of funds that was dedicated to prevention that targeting really wasn't a big issue under that program. When HPRP came along, we spent a lot of time talking about how to target the right, the quote unquote right population so not people who were chronically homeless, or those people who needed more assistance than HPRP could provide, but also, on the other hand, making sure that you were helping people who would become homeless but for the HPRP assistance. And we left a lot of that up to the grantees themselves to codify your targeting policies and procedures and create them and create what make, made the most sense for your communities. But we know that in, in some cases for different reasons, the targeting at the community level didn't really get specific beyond HUD's requirements. And often, you know, if it did happen, it wasn't formalized. So whether that's because the program was moving so fast or communities were short-staffed, um, you know, some communities may not really have been sure about how to target the funds very well. With emergency solutions grants, we're still talking about people who would become homeless if they did not receive the, the ESG assistance, but we've moved the income threshold down to 30% uh, of area median income from 50% AMI in HPRP. And we did that to help, help you make sure that you're targeting that more needy population and those people who are more likely to become homeless. We've also required that you create and document your own local standards for targeting that assistance so that everybody in your community knows exactly what to do and who your target population is. As a nation in general, we're moving away from the emergency shelter solution to homelessness into thinking about permanent housing, and the Emergency Solutions Grants Program reflects that shift. Next slide, please. We do want to recognize you have some challenges ahead with the implementation of ESG. There's definitely going to be a gap when HPRP goes away. There's no getting around that. HPRP provided $1.5 billion to be expended over a short time frame of two to three years. That was a challenge in and of itself just to spend that amount of funds in a quick time frame. But as a result, with HPRP, we've been able to prevent or end homelessness for over 1.2 million people. And ESG you know, just isn't going to be at that same level. I mean, it was a pretty amazing accomplishment that all those communities that we know you did because of your reporting. So at the same time that we're transitioning out of a world with HPRP, we're shifting from the Emergency Shelter Grants Program to the Emergency Solutions Grants Program. Although Emergency Solutions Grants is informed by the HPRP experience, it can't be implemented exactly like HPRP was 
or exactly like the Emergency Shelter Grant Program. First, obviously, the allocation for ESG is a lot smaller than HPRP. Second of all, there's a larger number of possible activities. So that makes your decision-making process at the grantee level all the more critical. So do you, do you fund a large number of activities uh, or subrecipients with less money, or do you fund a smaller subset with a larger funding amount? And there's also about 180 jurisdictions that got HPRP but will not be getting ESG. And that is a different type of a challenge for, um, especially for states, who we, we want to encourage states to consider funding the nonprofit organizations in the communities to provide HPRP-like activities and provide some um, consistency across uh, from HPRP to ESG. And then lastly, there are additional requirements for documentation and record keeping under ESG and data collection as well. So we're going to get into some of those details near the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. There are a lot of things that have not changed between ESG and HPRP, and that's just as important. So like all of you, we've learned a lot from HPRP, which we wrote into the ESG regs as much as we could. And when it wasn't possible to do that, um, we're putting out FAQs and creating policies around um, different types of questions and issues that are coming up. So first, both ESG and HPRP allow you to do rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention, and those are key aspects of both. Both programs focus on providing fast and appropriate support to maintain existing housing for the client or rapidly rehousing individuals and families from literal homelessness. Aid in both cases should be relatively short term and should prevent the entry or the need to stay in a shelter or a place that's unfit for human habitation. Both of the programs can be used as a short-term bridge to other housing programs under certain circumstances. And both programs have limits on the provision of short-term or medium-term assistance. Also, both have an important case management component to help connect program participants to other housing programs or supports. In addition, both programs emphasize the collection of data about the people served and the results from the services in HMIS and in the annual report. And then documentation is a really important piece of both as well. Also on the slide, we have coordination with continuums of care. That's, again, another key piece, although in ESG it's more formalized and it's also expanded. And then lastly, of course, both programs are part of the consolidated plan which is an established and familiar framework for grantees to work within. Next slide. Of course, there are some big and obvious differences. There are fewer jurisdictions receiving awards directly from HUD under ESG, and the eligible activities do have differences. There's a lot of different requirements around those activities. Again, we're going to talk some more about that later. But one of the big ones is that the assistance can be provided for up to 24 months for medium-term assistance instead of just 18 as it was under HPRP. And we did that in order to align the activity with some of the other, other homeless programs. The target populations are another key difference. ESG can serve homeless people as well as a further defined population of at risk. And again, that's a similarity, but with ESG, again, we took it back down to the 30% AMI level, and again, that's below 30% AMI. Um, and it, it was more defined than it was under HPRP. And that's especially because we're looking to assist people with higher levels of need with ESG. Another change is the reassessment period that program participants receiving rapid rehousing only need to be reassessed once a year. The documentation of policies and procedures under ESG is required to be formalized and documented in greater detail. And then, of course, Although collaboration with COCs was a requirement under HPRP, we know that in reality, for some communities, that dropped off pretty quickly after the planning process was over. But that's not going to be the case for ESG. HUD is expecting that communities are collaborating and coordinating throughout the implementation of ESG. One of the other huge differences between the programs is the way that you're going to be determining eligibility. So I'm going to spend a couple minutes on the next couple slides to make sure that we're all on the same page and um, make sure that everybody understands the definition. Next slide, please. Okay, 
So on this slide, we have um, the definition of homeless and eligibility for rapid rehousing in ESG. So as you, hopefully you know, the definition of homeless has changed. We put out the final rule um, in January, I believe. And so we're not going to get into a lot of detail here because we've had a lot of other webinars that have gone into it at length. But I do want to mention it because how you determine eligibility for rapid rehousing and prevention in ESG is a bit different. And I do want to note here that we're using the old definition of homeless for HPRP. So I'm going to repeat that. For HPRP eligibility determinations, do not use the new definition of homeless. You just want to stay with the same definition of homeless that was in place at the time HPRP was enacted. Okay. So when determining eligibility, First, you want to look at where the person is coming from to see what category of homeless they might fall under and determine what component type they might be eligible for. Individuals and families are eligible for rapid rehousing assistance if they are literally homeless under category one of the homeless definition. That's coming from the streets, shelter, or another place not fit for human habitation. And also, they might be eligible for rapid rehousing if they're fleeing a domestic violence situation, but that depends on their specific situation. If you want to become more familiar with those categories and specifically what's underneath them, again, we have some guidance materials, but I would also suggest looking at the wording in the reg because um, no summary is quite as good as actually reading what the reg says. You do have to do an initial assessment and document eligibility um, for ESG. But unlike HPRP, if someone is literally homeless, you don't have to document that they do not have enough income. So I know a lot of people are going to be excited about that. And then for rapid rehousing, you also don't have to reassess eligibility every three months. It's just at one year. So at that time, you do need to determine and document their income to make sure they're, that they're below 30% AMI and to make sure that they lack sufficient resources and support networks necessary to maintain the housing without assistance. So that concept is, is pretty much the same at the reassessment between HPRP and ESG, but the language that we use in the ESG reg is slightly different. Next slide. For homelessness prevention, um, an individual or family could be eligible if they are at imminent risk or at risk of homelessness, meaning those who qualify under paragraphs 2 and 3 of the homeless definition or those who qualify as at risk of homelessness. And this slide lays out who's eligible for homelessness prevention under ESG. Everyone must have an initial assessment to document eligibility. Again, that's just like HPRP. And for homelessness prevention, everyone must have an income that is below 30% AMI to be eligible. And just like HPRP, the reassessment for homelessness prevention is required every three months. For the reassessment, you're going to be looking at some of the same things, um, which is income. You want to ensure that they're below 30% AMI, and you want to look at their resources and support networks. Okay, so hopefully, you all are already familiar with that, and that was just a review. Next slide, please. As you think about making the transition from HPRP to ESG, RP experience. From this perspective, you should take the time to evaluate systems and processes that are already in place so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, because you can use many of these and carry them over for ESG or adapt them. So as a, as a recipient of funds or a grantee, you have providers in place who have experience providing that type of assistance, the prevention and the rapid rehousing. And you already have assessment processes and intake processes in place and roles and responsibilities in your community. So these may or may not need some adjusting to fit ESG, only you can know that. But it's, again, a basis that you want to start with. And you're also going to want to identify those subrecipients who manage the HPRP program well and who demonstrated capacity under HPRP and those who are going to be able to maintain that high capacity as well and consider awarding funds to them, again, for ESG. You also probably have established ways of targeting and assessing eligibility and the level of client need. And you have relationships with landlords. So all of those are things that, again, a starting point um, and things to consider as you move 
move forward with your implementation. And you, some of these subrecipients, again, are already working with target populations that you've identified. So another, you know, another starting point for you. Uh, but you, you do want to make sure that you're clear and upfront about your expectations for providers under ESG because that may have changed. Um, and you want to make sure everybody understands what's the same and what's different in your community about ESG as opposed to HPRB, and not just HUD rules, but again, what your local policies and procedures say and what your written standards say. All right, so, um, you know, and again, another aspect of this implementation that you can build on is the record keeping and HMIS. Um, we know that a lot of communities learned a lot more about HMIS through, through the HPRP implementation, so you can build on that. And I want to highlight, we talked about this a lot with HPRP, but monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. It's so, so, so important. Um, it was important under HPRP, and it's not going to get any less important under ESG. So, you know, again, make sure that you're working with your subs and you know what they're doing. Because HUD will also be monitoring for ESG. So we do have some promising practices up and posted on the HRE about communities that implemented new collaborations with HPRP with HPRP, whether it was a centralized intake process or more coordination among providers. So if your community did something like that that was new and innovative, will you keep it going? Can you keep it going? Would you consider doing that for ESG or doesn't it work? So again, all things that you need to think about and HUD doesn't have all those answers for you. Really. So next slide, please. On the slide, we're going to be talking um, to recipients and you know, asking recipients to consider thinking about the larger design of the programs. But subrecipients can ask themselves these questions as well, because I know there's a lot of subrecipients that have control over the way your own organization runs programs, or some subrecipients have subrecipients of their own. So again, this is just to highlight some of the things I've been talking about, but when, as you're reviewing your own policies and procedures that you use under HPRP, you want to think about what worked, what do you keep, what do you need to adapt to fit ESG? What didn't work so well? Or you know, what's not going to work under ESG? And remember, just because it did work in HPRP doesn't necessarily mean that you want to keep it for ESG, um, especially given if your community did a change in focus, um, a change in targeting, had changes in the funding priorities, et cetera. So, and also, if you included something in your substantial amendment for ESG for 2011 or your 2012 action plan, it, that doesn't mean that you have to keep it for 2013 and beyond. And that's the next theme that I want to talk about, which is moving forward, um, you know, what are you going to be doing now that you've implemented your substantial amendment? So we know that you're thinking this. Um, we get a lot of feedback from these HPRP webinars sometimes that people wish we had given them that information about six months ago. Um, and so we, we purposely wanted this webinar to be uh, designed to help you think about what you can do from this point forward, now that you've submitted your substantial amendment, now that you're, uh, you're probably well into thinking about your 2012 action plan, you're already starting to think about 2013. Um, what can you do to tighten up your standards? Maybe they were a little bit vague, or maybe they were a little bit broad. Um, and you know, now that you have a little bit of time to tighten up and refine any standards. So next slide, please. It's not too late. Um, it's not too late to ask the questions we've been talking about, to implement changes, to work with your community, to work with your providers, no matter where you are in your grant cycle. Um, you can update your written standards and get more specific for 2013 and beyond. Um, and you know, we do know that it can be difficult to adjust your written standards sometimes, especially if you have difficult, you know, if you have a, a bureaucratic process or a political process in place, you know, that's the reality. Um, but again, it's it's still, you have time right now to put different practices in place. And again, whether it's formalized or whether it's not, putting things into place to improve your on-the-ground implementation. So whether it's improving the coordination of service providers or just helping people become more familiar with the regs, and become more familiar with the practices. You know, I, I think that we want to stress the urgency of now is an important time to, to 
help make sure that you're learning from HPRP moving forward for ESG. Next slide. <clears throat> so from HUD's perspective, you know, we've been talking a lot about focusing on results with ESG. So here are HUD's recommendations for your focus on this transition and beyond. We're asking that you increase the percentage of resources spent on rapid rehousing and that you target your funds carefully to devote resources to the population that's in the greatest need. We want you to focus on results, not only for the families and individuals who are being housed, but also the results on the homeless system in the community. For example, you want to look to see if these resources were able to lower the demand for other homeless programs such as shelters and transitional housing and reduce rates of homelessness in the area. We're asking that you compile HMIS data errors or missing data and look at the reports from the system because that reflects the outcomes in your community and also helps you see the areas where improvements are needed in your HMIS system and your data collection and in your homeless system in your area as well. And again, you know, you want to make sure that you're working with your continuum of care and your continuum of care or continuums of care um, because joining forces with the other providers can achieve a bigger impact overall. And I put, want to put in a plug, if you haven't seen Secretary Donovan's short video message about HUD's priorities for using ESG, I would strongly recommend it. It's a really nice summary, and it's a pretty compelling piece um, where he, he just summarizes what, you know, what, like I said, HUD's priorities are. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to spend two more slides hammering home this message about rapid rehousing. And here's why. Um, I've talked to people who have said, well, yes, yes, I understand that HUD wants us to do rapid rehousing, but we know that homelessness prevention works in our community, so that doesn't fit what we want to do. So it may be that you have a careful targeting program, and it may be that you've done some analysis on outcomes with HPRP, or that you feel that homelessness prevention is filling a gap in service provision. But if you still have homeless people on the streets, and people in shelters, then why not spend those resources to help people that you know are homeless now? Why not use other resources to help those that might or might not become homeless and reduce the number of people who are living in shelters and on the streets and reduce the time that they have to spend there? So that's our perspective and our, you know, the reason that we're pushing some of this. Prevention is more difficult and, you know, some people think that it seems more humane. For example, why do you want to make somebody go to the shelter before you help them? Um, or they think it's more effective. But there's more and more research showing that it's difficult to do effectively. There are many individuals and families with very low incomes and who have other issues, but it is a small minority that actually become literally homeless. Research shows that you have to help a very large number of people with homelessness prevention to have any effect on the number of people who are literally homeless. And there are communities who are doing studies now of their HPRP or other prevention programs, and they're coming up with similar results. So again, something to think about. Um, we're asking just that you take a careful look at your data and consider investing some time to see whether what you're doing is really preventing homelessness or just helping people who are in a housing crisis who would not actually become homeless. And a lot of those people, you know, they do, even though they are in a housing crisis, they find another way and they don't need assistance. So we want you to focus on the most in need. And if you do have stories or research that you want to share with HUD and other communities, feel free to submit it to us on the virtual help desk because we're always looking for more community examples. And with that, I will pass this back to Caroline to talk about planning for the end of HPRP. Thank you, Susan. So let's put our compliance hats on at this time. Um, we're switching gears just for a moment while we have a captive audience. Um, I want to talk about some things that people are pretty interested in, which is uh, wrapping up HPRP and a few other sundry items that we'll go through. Next slide, please. Um, first, let's talk about spending down the rest of your funds. Um, grantees are required to spend 100% of their HPRP award. These are recovery funds and expenditure has been, uh, level of expenditure has been one of the primary things that Congress has focused on, OMB, the Vice President's Office, the President, everyone. So as you know, the whole message has been spend, 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 
which isn't always consistent with serving people in need, but we do have to pay attention um, that our authorizing legislation requires this. Failure to spend all the funds could result in a permanent record of non-performance on a Recovery Act program designed to address the needs of the nation's most vulnerable population, um, especially because HPRP is a part of the Recovery Act. Communities who do not spend all their funds, and especially those who gave up trying to use the funds even when there was time to reconsider, will likely be subject to criti critical reviews in the media and before Congress. Additionally, such non-performance must often be reported in applications for other federal funding and could become a consideration for future funding opportunities to include ESG. What this really means um, in terms of dollars is that on our most recent projection, 307 of the 535 HPRP grantees are projected not to spend a total of almost $55 million. So that's over half of the HPRP grantees leaving um, $55 million on the table in our projection to help prevent and end homelessness for individuals and families in their communities. Of the 307, 21 grantees have projected shortfalls exceeding a million, a half a million dollars, $500,000 or more. Um, and their hunk of the $55 million is $29 million. So that's only 21 grantees. If you don't spend these funds, um, they will be recaptured and returned to the U.S. Treasury. These are not HUD monies, so we don't get to keep them and reallocate them for, for people in need. If, if we don't spend them, they go back. Next slide, please. There are options to help you um, if you'd like to spend the rest of your funds. You can reallocate to other subgrantees who are still providing services. You could reopen your program if you've closed parts of it down. You can work with HUD to identify barriers and plans for overcoming them. We've seen um, some grantees or subgrantees partner with programs that serve a simi similar population. And provided you can um, deem someone eligible, you could use HPRP dollars as an adjunct to continued services for other people. Because I know we're all worried about taking people in the program now that it's ending who, who have continued needs. You can consider billing for retroactive indirect costs. According to the HPRP guidance, we've had a couple calls with grantees who did not um, take advantage of the ability to bill indirect and have been able to do so retroactively. Another thing that might be helpful is to make sure that you have properly classified your activities within IDIS. IDIS is the Integrated Disbursement Information System. It is the drawdown system that the grantees who are the primary recipients um, draw down their, their funds from so that they can you know, reimburse their subgrantees for HPRP activities. And what we've seen in some, some recent monitorings is that misclassifications could free up dollars for admin. For instance, one grantee had a bookkeeper who was pretty much only processing rental checks and utility checks for clients. Um, they had them charged to admin instead of to financial assistance. So by correcting that, those dollars um, for admin were freed up so that they could cover costs and, and up their expenditure rate at the same time. So please double check your charges and make sure they're correct. Work with your finance and accounting uh, folks. Next slide, please. If you would like to request TA, um, I would recommend doing it in the virtual help desk, but also let your field office know and let your HPRP desk officer know. We can look for your request in the help desk and try to move it along. Um, and we, you may get TA from any combination of field office staff, headquarters staff, and or technical assistance providers. Next slide, please. So this topic is another sundry item that we're throwing in, um, mainly because the Inspector General for HUD is out auditing HPRP and other Recovery Act programs um, heavily right now. They seem to have a lot of funds for that purpose. And one of the things that um, they continue to make findings about is about the jobs calculation that is required in your quarterly report to federalreporting.gov. Um, this has been confusing from the beginning, and there are a couple reasons why. Um, initially, we were asked to guess, essentially, um, whether the jobs that are being funded by HPRP would have been created or retained without this funding. It was kind of like a but-for for 
job creation. And so it was a little bit fuzzy. You had to, you really essentially had to guess, um, would this job have existed if this Recovery Act program had not come along? Well, when we got the first quarter data back, or when OMB did, they realized that that wasn't a really sound way of, of reporting jobs created. So um, starting with the second quarter, they issued new guidance, which we have a link to at the bottom of this slide, which now requires that all you have to report each quarter is the labor that you paid for with HPRP funds. So any salary paid for out of HPRP funds during the quarter in question has to be reported in terms of full-time equivalent. Um, what, what we typically see is that grantees, they get this for admin, and it's no problem to report what admin positions you're funding. A lot of times, uh, the grantees will forget to include sub-grantee labor um, or sub-sub labor, and especially in situations where they don't do timesheet billing, but they might do fee-for-service. You know, I'm billing you for case management for one client. Um, that also needs to be reported, and you have to come up with some way to estimate how much time and how to equate full-time, I'm sorry, uh, fee-for-service billing into full-time equivalency. If you have questions about this, please also check with your HPRP desk officer. We can help. Um, next slide, please. So a big question on everyone's mind is, what do we do about HPRP participants who are not stable at the end of the period of assistance? Uh, many people thought that serving folks who would be stable at the end was a requirement for eligibility. Um, it, was ne it wasn't necessarily a requirement. It was a means of targeting. And we know even the best targeting might result in folks that are not stable at the end of the period of assistance. Um, so we want to make sure that we're able to take care of these people responsibly. And we encourage you to develop schedules and processes for notifying your participants, your landlords, um, service partners, um, utilities even, and just do, do what you can to make sure that you're letting people know that, that the period of assistance is about to come to an end. If, if you can develop a plan for each participant, um, you need to include in that plan any other resources available to that person. Um, use your partnerships, use your connections with the COC to try to get other resources in, lined up for that person. And then you, you can assess to see if any of your, your people left over from HPRP who aren't stable could be eligible for ESG. Um, next slide, please. But do keep in mind, um, these people are not grandfathered in. This is not an automatic eligibility. If someone was not successfully served by HPRP, they are not automatically um, able to be served by ESG. You need to reassess for eligibility, and as Susan mentioned, um, eligibility is a little bit different, and the income requirements, for instance, are more stringent. Um, they, whatever period of assistance they had under HPRP, that will start over. So should they be eligible, you start the clock over for them. So that's good news. But their housing status does not transfer. So if you have someone who was homeless under HPRP, they kept their homeless status, even if they stayed stably housed for the entire duration of assistance. But going into ESG, it's going to be where they're currently housed. So if they're, if they're someone in an apartment being assisted with HPRP, they would be under prevention and not rapid rehousing, regardless of their original status. Reassessment, if it is a prevention client, is required more frequently than for, for prevention than for rapid rehousing. And keep in mind that there is a 100% match required for ESG recipients that can be cash or in kind. So um, HMIS is also something you need to be thinking about. Um, you need to exit all your participants upon program completion. We see in a lot of QPRs that sometimes people don't exit people in a timely manner. And we know that you do that because someone might need help again. They might be coming through the door. Um, and you don't really want to exit them if you think that they're going to need more assistance. Well, now that we're wrapping up, you need to make sure you're on top of this, um, and you need to exit your, your, your participants from the program. Um, exiting them essentially disassociates them from HPRP. It does not delete them from the system. 
And you need to make sure you add the date of the exit and their destination. Um, please don't hesitate to be honest in your assessment of, of what their circumstances are, whether they're stably or unstably housed. This is important, and we need to know um, exactly what happened. And if an exited participant will be served under another program, either ESG or a COC program, they should be added under that program to be counted properly. Next slide. So what if you're our community, one of those 176 communities that um, got HPRP but you won't get ESG? You may consider applying to your state ESG program, um, but be aware that you, you have to check the state's processes for how they're going to allocate, how they're going to run their application process and award process. And there could be a time lag in the receipt of those awards. So if that's one of your plans for someone who isn't stable at the end, um, there might be a lot of time you have to build in to take care of that person with other resources in the interim. Um, you have to consider other resources in the community. And think about using um, other resources such as hud -Vash or tenant-based rental assistance. Um, I would think that these communities should um, not only be working with their state ESG, but to really, should really partner with their COC um, as they transition. HUD VASH can be used um, to pay for security deposits and arrears for rent and or utilities. Um, and the tenant-based rental assistance program, it pays um, rent and it pays utilities but it doesn't always pay for the supportive services that folks need. Um, so you might consider partnering with uh, the TBRA program and, and using ESG and or HPRP dollars to, to do moving costs, motel and hotel vouchers, legal services, case management, housing search and placement, and or credit repair. Next slide, please. OK, so we're all waiting for the grant closeout procedures for HPRP. Um, and while these are still under review, um, we wanted to go ahead and give you a preview. Next slide, please. So they are under review, and they will be published soon. And we have been saying that for a little while. Um, and I, I said this on the last webinar, and it is kind of true. We, this is an office that runs a lot of uh, formula grants, and we don't typically close grants out. So this is new for us as well. So thank you for bearing with us as we get these things finalized. There should be a grant closeout tool um, coming prior to the issuance of the procedures, um, and it should be posted on the HRE. Make sure that you're on the HPRP listserv, and you'll be alerted as soon as that is published. Um, and here are, here's an overview of what the steps that have to happen in, in order for HUD to close out a grant. Again, the, the closeout procedures will detail this, um, but this is just a quick overview so you know what to expect. All eligible activities and must be completed and all data entered into HMIS. All grant funds must be expended and used to pay for eligible costs. Next slide. All required reporting completed. All funds drawn from IDIS and marked complete in IDIS. Any special conditions met. Any monitoring completed and findings closed. Any audit findings resolved and any allowable cost adjustments and repayments made. Next page. So the criteria for initiating closeout includes um, three years must have passed since the date HUD signed your grant agreement, or the grantee has completed its program, which has three components to it. The first is that you finished all of your activities and done all your data entry. Next slide, please. And the most important one is that you've expended 100% of your grant funds. So what that means is you can only close out your grant if your three-year date has come and gone and it's passed, or you've expended 100% of your funds. If you have not expended 100% and your three-year date is not, has not passed, you can't close out yet. We will not initiate closeout. Um, and then again, you have to re resolve all monitoring and audit findings. So, I want to say more about why you can't close your program out if you have um, unspent funds before the three-year date. Um, our lawyers have told us this would equate to what the CFR calls a termination of convenience, which effectively reduces your grant award. And it's as though you declined your full award. Um, 
this would likely trigger your substantial amendment process, a public comment period, and citizen participation period. And really, it's not something you want to do. Um, so if you get to your three-year point and you haven't expended all your funds, that's just considered noncompliance with the expenditure requirement. It's not considered a termination for convenience. Therefore, um, we're going to wait until the three years if 100% have not been expended. You have 90 days after the deadline to draw down funds. Um, the key is you may only draw in that 90 days for expenditures that were incurred prior to your, your end date. You cannot incur new expenditures in that 90-day period. Um, and after that 90-day period, no further funds may be drawn. Next slide, please. Uh, keep in mind that your closeout has to be compliant with, um, as, with the CFR requirements that, and regulations that all federal grant closeouts must comply with, including further repayment obligations, audit requirements, equipment requirements, and record retention and access. So um, if you're unfamiliar with those, check out the citations in the CFR and make sure that you are um, on top of all of these pieces of closeout. Next slide, please. We will recapture any funds not expended. And we will be reviewing your final reports and make any adjustments necessary um, before returning the remainder of your balance to the US Treasury. Next, next slide, please. So these are the specifics on the reporting requirements. Again, these will be forthcoming in the closeout procedures. But just so you know, um, you have three years from your end date. I'm three years. You have 90 days from your three-year um, expenditure deadline or 60 days after the end of the federal fiscal year to get all of your required final reports in. Federalreporting.gov does have a deadline of October 10th for your Q13 report. Um, they often will extend the deadline, so pay attention to see if they do that. And the year three APR will be due by the earlier of 90 days after your three-year expenditure deadline or 60 days after the end of the federal fiscal year. Keep in mind, you're not required to submit the SF-425. Um, we have permission that, to let IDIS and the functions and reports that we get from IDIS fulfill that requirement instead. Next slide, please. So the good news is that the year three APR is currently open. Um, we haven't yet sent out a listserv about it, but you should be able to go into ESAPs and access it if you're waiting to do your final report. Um, we encourage you to complete your year three APR early. Don't, please don't wait until the November deadline. And um, like I said, there should be a listserv coming out about it, but you're hearing about it early here. And now I will turn the presentation over to Tammy. Thank you, Caroline. And that's certainly dynamic news. We can't emphasize enough how much the data contained in your APRs helps to highlight the impact made to individuals and families in your community. And as many HPRP grantees know, the data from your HMIS can assist local governments to understand and analyze gaps also. And even though you have already established policies and procedures, a good program builds in feedback mechanisms to continue to use performance data and other information to refine your service delivery to strategically meet changing needs with fewer resources. Next slide. So let's talk about identifying resources. When thinking about gaps in service provision, understanding the available and often limited resources is key. For example, HPRP has either ended in your community or is in the process of ending. How will your community use the limited ESG funds to fill gaps? And what service will you prioritize in your community? With HPRP, the challenges experienced were quickly coordinating both mainstream and frontline service providers and implementing a program that had to spend the money in a tight time frame. Trust me, we've heard all of the feedback, and we understand and appreciate all of the efforts made. We received um, many stories successful about how communities came together and dealt with difficult priorities. That certainly is always something you're going to experience, especially in political climate. But getting the right people to understand the urgency of spending the program funds in according with program requirements is always uh, a key issue expressed. 
With ESG, recipients have already completed the substantial amendment and your FY 2012 action plan. Therefore, HUD expects you to continue to update and refine your written standards in the fiscal year 2013 action plan and beyond. So ESG recipients should either use established systems from HPRP or build in mechanisms to ensure standards are appropriate and reflect current needs that ESG will address in the community. Next slide. Let's look at evaluating need. And it's crucial that you take time and evaluate what was first outlined in your substantial amendment and action plan to ensure it best supports the needs of your community. And if necessary, talk about how to revise and update it. In many cases, much of this is already done for FY11 and 12, but you still should be thinking about, uh, for example, if or how rapid rehousing assistance or homelessness prevention assistance can support the homelessness efforts of frontline providers in your community. Or should there be a greater focus on rental assistance versus mainstream agency providing case management assistance, such as a locally funded mental health agency or substance abuse agency that's providing the same type of case management service to the same family or individual. Also think about conducting an evaluation as part of an annual quarterly performance reporting period where there is an established review of expenditures. And really consider the impact HPRP had on collaborations amongst agencies that may not have worked together um, previously. Take time and look at how successful those partnerships were, because that could also provide insight into how closing HPRP can affect your ESG allocation. Next slide, please. So evaluating how your funds can best support all of the initiatives in your communities, which vary across all of the homeless programs and disabled programs, is something that everyone across the nation faces at different times. And evaluation itself takes time and must really begin with knowing what works, what doesn't work in your community, in comparison to what you have in place versus what needs to be built. This could raise possibilities for changes to your system that could cause a greater impact. In many communities, the result of the economy is causing such a greater need to arise, a new face of homelessness, however, with less resources um, to be able to provide assistance to those. So consider many options of the funding streams in place. For example, Homes Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Program, TBRA, doesn't fund case management, only financial assistance. So could you create a program with case management funded, um, let's say even by ESG, and have financial assistance funded by TBRA? Also evaluate your supportive housing and shelter plus care programs, which may include supportive services and leasing or rental assistance, and how that could support an increase in changes, again, in the different type of homelessness that you're seeing in your community, whether it's increased or decreased. Next slide, please. Clearly establishing performance standards for your COC and a process for evaluating program effectiveness is of greatest importance to HUD and allows the community to identify service gaps quickly and then continuing to reevaluate those performance standards. Using, for example, HMIS and trends in the point in time data, that alone could assist you with studying local demographics to determine any stuff. It can help track clients that return to homelessness. Recidivism is common. Identify even um, when follow-up assistance is needed for most and when new services need to be put in place. Next slide, please. So the great thing about the Emergency Solutions Grant is it includes two key components to fund possible forms of new housing assistance in uh, rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention. Both of these options may be new to many communities who primarily use the emergency shelter grant to solely fund shelter operations. So let's discuss some very important highlights about the new emergency solutions grant and how it can build onto what you may have or may not have in place currently. Next slide. Previously mentioned on slide 15, addressing building on existing practices, Susan addressed the need for collaborations with experienced partners and the need for a good selection process. 
There are valuable lessons learned by service providers who created processes for intake and evaluation and even established new housing personnel and built many landlords relationships through HPRP. So considering um, how to use the experienced HPRP providers could increase your knowledge base when building a rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention program in your community. It's good to find organizations that have experience with similar programs, but also those interested in new models and the possibility of collaborations that benefit the participants. Establish a selection process that clearly indicates the agency's skill set in place and your program expectations. And one thing to note is that the public housing authorities are not eligible subrecipients and cannot be waived by HUD. Susan, can you add clarity to this? Absolutely. Um, this is a key question that we have gotten a lot about ESG. And um, you know, it says on the slide here, I'll just read it, only a public housing agency that is a unit of general purpose local government may receive ESG funds. So that's if your PHA is just a part of your city or county government. Um, PHAs are not eligible subrecipients, and HUD can't waive it. You can, however, procure any organization to run ESG, including a PHA, but you do have to make sure that you're following the regulations at 24 CFR Part 85.36. And we want to be clear that this is not meant to be a workaround on the prohibition on subgranting to a PHA. You know, if you do have a high-performing PHA that can win a free and open competition, which is required under the regs, um, in order to provide services under ESG, then that's fine. But ESG is just, it's not designed to be administered by PHAs. Um, and there's a lot of complications that can come up with that. So that's why that prohibition on subgranting to a PHA is in place. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions, and we're fielding them. So if you do have other questions, please let us know via the virtual help desk. Back to you, Tammy. Well, that's, um, uh, I thank you for clarifying that, Susan, because it's an area that we often uh, receive a lot of questions about and that we do have to monitor. So remember, again, anything that we discussed, if you have questions or clarifications needed, please contact your local HUD field office or submit them into the virtual help desk. But again, note on the slide that HUD cannot waive this requirement. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so for some exciting news with the Emergency Solutions Grant, um, so let's get the attention of all of our case managers and clinical staff for a minute, the folks that handle intake and services. There are some very important new requirements that uh, when you start implementing your Emergency Solutions Grant. Learn from HPRP a crucial uh, differences noted across the nation regarding serving eligible participants and maintaining evidence of the eligibility. It is often subject to termination that we to interpretation that we found, but we must, when monitoring, come and see evidence. Many of the monitoring reviews conducted for HPRP revealed, and step in here for me, Caroline, they revealed that engagement and service provision lack the support of efforts actually made by staff. They um, often knew the situation with the client and could tell you doc, uh, conversations, but the documentation just wasn't there. Um, and I'll just jump in to say that I've been a case manager, and you're, we, we know that you're always in the struggle to serve the person in front of you who is in crisis and to actually then document what it is that you've done. Um, and I think that that's the problem here. We have people out there doing so many things. Um, just keep in mind that we, we know you're um, doing a balancing act, and you just have to give yourself credit by putting it in the documenting what you've done in the file. Absolutely. Thanks, Caroline. So we can't emphasize that enough. Ensuring that you have a documented housing stability plan, monthly meetings with the case manager, and referrals to mainstream and other resources uh, is what we're going to be looking for. These are three new key requirements under the Emergency Solutions Grant. And they all must be maintained in central record. We, most of the time it's in a case file, but in some type of location where we can identify them. Um, these are new requirements under ESG, and uh, it's important to remember two things. First of all, remember that a client who was in HPRP does not automatically become eligible for ESG. So we will, again, as Caroline said earlier, be looking for documentation of that initial assessment. And it's also important to note that service providers who receive funds through the Violence Against Women Act and or the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act 
cannot require victims of domestic violence to participate in services as a condition of continued participation in your ESG program. All right, next slide. The newly allows under the Emergency Solutions Grant to support the homeless populations in your community is the provision to pay ongoing rental assistance for up to 24 months. Yay! Or to provide a one-time rental arrears payment with a limit of six months. This is another area where documentation is critical. In our HPRP Common Monitoring Findings webinar a while back, we actually included a handwritten bill from a landlord to collect arrears from a tenant which was ineligible and did not contain enough information to support paying the expense. It is the burden of the provider to ensure that clear documentation outlines the six months of arrears paid if that is an assistance you decide to provide. Otherwise, as has been done with HPRP and other housing programs, the agency ends up paying the not clearly documented cost to reimburse the federal government out of their non-federal funds. Remember, documentation is simply is key. With regards to the same cost type rule as with HPRP, it must be clear that there is no other public program paying the same cost at the same time as ESG. So going back to my rental arrears example, this means that the staff approving the payment of the rental arrears, let's say for the month of May 2012, must ensure that there is not another payment being made for rental arrears for the same month of May 2012. The best way to think about it is the same cost, for example here being rental arrears, for the same time period being May 2012 is the trigger. Next slide, please. All right, and as with HPRP rental assistance, Eligible participants must have a written lease agreement on file in order to provide ongoing rental assistance. However, new under ESG is that when paying rental arrears, a rental assistance agreement is required between the unit owner and the recipient or sub-recipient, not negotiable. Another key difference between both of the programs is HPRP required that a cost comparison be evidenced for all units to ensure the rent is reasonable. Yes, we did. However, the ESG not only requires that the rent be reasonably documented, but that it also be submitted to HUD's fair market rent, the FMR. In this case, both standards apply. Next slide. All right, I'm coming home now. As with HPRP and other federal programs, the lead-based paint requirements apply with ESG. Must be a visual assessment uh, for all units receiving financial assistance. If constructed pre-1978 and there's a child under six or a pregnant woman who lives there. Um, however, also new with uh, ESG is that a habitability inspection must be conducted and documented prior to paying any financial assistance, both arrears and rental assistance. So a habitability inspection must also be conducted. And here, this is a key difference from HPRP, where habitability was only required when moving into a new unit. ESG requires both um, a habitability inspection at move-ins and when paying arrears. And remember, housing is in our name, so we're adamant about no HUD funds being paid for any uninhabitable unit. So as you see, there are some great new features under the Emergency Solutions Grant, but Susan, i got to bring you back in. Can you summarize the ESG to HPRP to ESG bridge for us? <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Um, so next slide, please. With HPRP, uh, we had a, it was a pretty quick and intense implementation of the program, and it, it did force communities to establish new processes and new protocols. You know, and we, we know that in many cases, communities came together in innovative ways to make the program work in, in the time frame and given the new activities that it uh, provided. So ESG does formalize some of that, but a lot of it is still up to you to make sure that those positive innovations and positive processes continue. So one of the messages that we hope you take home from this webinar is that while you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you do have to use ESG in a strategic way, not only because it's a smaller amount of money, but because it is a different uh, creature from 
emergency shelter grants and from HPRP. And while you can help people with ESG who would become homeless, again, after HPRP ends, um, there are some significant differences between the programs that you need to be aware of that we talked about today and some other pitfalls with HPRP ending that we're, you know, we're on the lookout for and we are asking you to be too. Throughout the implementation of HPRP, communities have developed a lot of tools. Some of them we've posted on the HRE, some of them we haven't. Um, and actually, some of them we're going to be, through the coming months, we're going to be repurposing those tools and resources and posting them on the HRE to help you use them for ESG. Because a lot of times, like we said, some things will be a little bit different, and we're going to put out different resources for you for that. And again, as I said, HUD continues to learn the same way that you do. We learn a lot from your experiences, from your stories, and from your questions, so keep them coming. Um, we've had a lot of successes with HPRP both at the community level and at the personal level. And we have those success stories posted on the HRE, and we'll continue to try to keep sharing those as we move forward. So again, keep those coming in through the HRE. So we've, we've been saying from the beginning of HPRP that it's like building a, pla a plane in the air while we've been flying it. And well, we actually like this metaphor that's shown on the slide here, um, represented by that picture, that now we're building a bridge from HPRP to ESG. One more slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So after this webinar, um, you're going to receive a survey by email to provide us with your evaluation and feedback. Uh, on the slide, it shows the objectives of this webinar. So please complete the survey and rate us on how well we achieve those objectives. And with that, thank you for your attention. And have a good afternoon. This ends the webinar. <laughs>